scorn, 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 scorn. The emblem of the red dragon has been used to represent Wales since around 830 AD. However, it first took prominence as a symbol of patriotism and strength when risen by Owen Glendore in 1400, who rode into battle under the dragon against the English hordes. And as art skills improved across Wales, depictions of the red dragon were iterated, with the current fella becoming the official flag of Cymru in 1807, coincidentally the very same year Alan Wynne-Jones was to be born. Stories of the Welsh dragon spread. The color becoming synonymous with the Welsh and ever since playing their first rugby international in 1881 Wales have played in red. In fact Wales wouldn't play in any colour other than red until drawing Tonga in the 1987 World Cup. These days the red dragon is inexorably linked with Wales, a crest surmising the nation's bravery, ferocity and willingness to never lay down and die. It's a symbol that the modern day rugby team wears with pride and many believe to be the reason that for 140 years Wales have played in red. Those people are wrong. Wales play in red because red is the colour of jam and there is no git jammier worldwide right now than a Welshman after Wales smashed down the door for the shithouse slam to move into stage four, entering the history books as the first team to ever win the triple crown by dunking it in sugar and turning it into a preserve. So, how did Wales jam, 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 jam their way to a record points total and bonus point win against the very enemy they first drew on the dragon to defeat? And what should England fans be taking from this game once they're done shouting at the ref? And speaking of which, I should probably just get into the two heaviest dollops of jam on that triple crown. I have a policy on this channel of not talking about refereeing decisions, largely because they eat up too much of post-match discourse in rugby, and I find talking about what the two teams were actually trying to do far more interesting. But for this particular game, I recognise I kind of have no choice but to touch on them. So let's get it out of the way. The second try, awarded after half an hour to Liam Williams, was kind of bullshit. If we're to go by the wording of the laws, it exists in a weird tiny grey area where it doesn't fit the definition of either a knock-on or a kick. But if we're to use our common sense, it's far closer to the knock-on category. This decision is not black and white, but it is very dark grey. I'd say it's maybe 96% a knock-on but Wales happened to land in the lucky 4% on Saturday. However, there was more controversy as England were on the end of a Josh Adams moment so surprising you'd think it was his sister's gender reveal party. However, I'm going to be blunt, right? There is absolutely nothing wrong with this try. And before you leave an angry comment, hear me out. The outrage at this decision has essentially come from how the TV coverage was edited. Bigger launched the cross kick just as we were cutting back from a close up of the penalty fence and every replay cuts in right as he kicks, never showing what went on before. However, let's have a look what actually happens, courtesy a couple of previously unseen angles, all thanks to Roger from BBC Sport who forwarded them over to me. Huge thank you. Whilst Farrell is talking to the referee, George Ford calls all 15 England players into a huddle to expend some tactical advice. Anthony Watson is reluctant, but Ford demands he come in as well so he can share his observations and advice. Farrell rejoins and has the brief chat Gauzer asked for, and then England players begin to disperse. Slade is the first to head back into position, Ford, George, May, Daly all follow suit, and then the entire England pack start to shuffle back into a line. The whole time, Gauzer is watching England so he can give them ample time to set, waiting until they've spread out into a defensive line before he blows time on. Dan Bigger asks him a question, he briefly turns to look at him, but this just buys England an extra couple of seconds. All in all, there are 9.59 seconds between England players beginning to take position after Farrell stops talking and Gauzer blowing his whistle to signal time back on. For the sake of comparison, Italy were given two similar warnings in the other game this weekend, and in one of them, they were given 3.48 seconds to set, and in the other, time wasn't even stopped. England had plenty of time to get into position, and it's hard to argue with that because they did manage it on this side. Seven seconds before time is called on, May begins to sprint to cover his wing, because that's his job. Contrast that to the dawdling Anthony Watson, who makes no effort to get back into position before time is on, 
Figuring Wales are just going to take the shot, who cares? Ford is the only English player watching bigger and manages to cut Adams off in the corner. International defenders are coached to snap back into a line in 2 to 3 seconds. England had just shy of 10. Lewis Reed Samet can run the length of the pitch in that time, yet his opposite number makes no effort to cover half the width. I totally understand why England fans felt aggrieved at the time. Farrell's anger is contagious and in each replay understandably focus on the action rather than the lingering. The teams waiting around while time's off isn't very interesting to the viewer. But then once the game finished, the media will stir up controversy because it, it sells, you know, it sells. And we need to keep people talking during a break week. But this score is more about the laziness of Anthony Watson than Pascal Gauzer or even Wales doing something ungamesly. And, you know, from a Welsh perspective, this is really sharp. Really smart and, altogether now, really jammy. The penalty is awarded and Dan Bigger takes the ball on the spot. The whole time stood casually, ball in one hand, hanging about, never looking over to the touchline. Instead of Adam shouting and drawing attention to himself in an empty stadium, Liam Williams passes on the message. He saunters over to Bigger, says three or four words, then walks off. Immediately, Bigger looks briefly over to the wing to check where Adam's is. And that's it. The next time Bigger so much as glances at the touchline, he's already shaping to kick. There are no signs in his body language that he's doing anything but waiting for the tee, and it invites England to be complacent. He then turns to the referee and says, Can you just tell us when your you time is back on? Just making Gauzer aware that Wales are going to do something. In that moment, he wins him over from any controversy, calmly talking the referee into the idea and setting it in his mind before Farrell can have his squawk. Finn Russell did the same thing with Galzer a few years ago, telling him he's going to take the wicket out whilst Australia prepping for him to head for the corner and allowing him to unleash Hugh Jones to score. This kick is pinpoint and instant. It's brilliant by Bigger. And Adams finishes it superbly. It's a brilliant bit of play by the Welsh backs, who catch England not so much napping, but reaching out to put their alarm clock back on snooze when they really ought to be waking up. And the worst thing is, it happened again at the start of the second half. This is a really dumb penalty by Johnny Hill, and Kieran Hardy just glances up once. Elliot Daly has turned his back to get back into position, so Hardy taps. With Daly paying no attention, the only England player who could stop him is Tom Curry, who has a split second to decide what to do, knowing a tackle before Hardy's made 10 metres would result in a yellow card. So Curry just kind of saunters until Hardy makes a few yards, and his whole brain realises what he's done and goes, SHIT! He reaches for him, but Hardy dives early and nothing is stopping him scoring Wales' third try. Neither of these were quick thinking so much as something Wales clearly identified as a key English weakness beforehand. Their laziness and want to switch off after a penalty is conceded. Rhys Samet is also on the far touchline in case it's May that's late to set for the Adams try. Sheedy is racing into support Hardy before he even takes the tap, knowing it's coming. But the best example is Bigger before he kicks this opening penalty. As it's awarded, Owens throws the ball back to him and Bigger just checks where Watson and Adams are. Even subtly beginning to shape the kick before deciding it isn't on and taking the shot. And man alive did they get plenty of chances to take advantage as England gave away a frankly absurd 15 penalties. Over three games, England have now conceded more penalties than four of the six nations did across the full 2019 tournament and are well on track to break Italy's all-time five or six nations record of 66 in one campaign. However, the real problem isn't the number so much as the sequence. Eddie Jones as England, at their best, like to strike early and take control of the game in the first few minutes so they can kind of sit back and just casually whip the opposition for the remaining 76. On Saturday, the first three passages of the game all end with England giving away a penalty. It was like the rugby equivalent of the Brexit negotiations. Instead of taking back control, England went almost out of their way to gift total authority to their opposition in the very early stages. And so, particular mention has to go to one Mr. Maro Atoje, a man who has comprehensively played his way out of the Lions captaincy and possibly even starting 15, I swear, over the course of three games. Every time you think Atoje has finally sorted out his deathly addiction to giving away dumb professional fouls, it comes back with a vengeance. And on Saturday, he was more desperate for his next hit of being marched back 10 than ever. Atoje's first two penalties are the first two of the game, and from that moment on, Wales actively target him. Adam Beard here pins him to the floor. Alwyn Jones jogs an extra yard to get in his way. And whilst I don't know what happens here, there must be a reason Justin Tibbrick and Mara Atoje, the two fittest players on the field, are back well after everyone else. And so, as the nudges continue, the penalties begin to rack up. He committed more on his own than the full Welsh 23 conceded the last time this fixture was played in Cardiff. And so, come penalty number five, the referee warns Atoje that one more, 
and he's in the bin. So of course, at Toji's next involvement at all here, five Welsh players can be seen or heard pointing him out to the officials. Atoji's actions are legal, and Galzea doesn't fall for it, because believe it or not, he's a professional referee and not some kind of Valley's voodoo doll, but it's close enough to the edge that another referee might have bought it and sent him to the bin. And it's not just the penalty count. As that begins to rise, Atoji's form begins to drop. Here, a well-timed pass by Shidi allows Wales to get outside England, and whilst Daly rushes in to cover it well, Wales clear out quickly with Roger Jones the only forward sucked into the ruck. As such, Shidi has four runners on him as the ball comes out. Cowan Dickey flies up ready to smash him, however, just as the fly-off is approaching, Cowan Dickey notices Atoje hasn't come up as part of the line. He's instead just mooching about near the ruck. If Atoje is here, as he should be, he covers Navidi, Cowan Dickey covers Shidi, Wales gets smashed behind the game line. Instead, Cowan Dickey has to consider Shidi's dummy, because if he gives the pass, there's a fair chance Navidi is right through. The hooker tries to cover both men, but it just allows Shidi to squeeze between the front rowers and out the other side, before putting in a really sneaky little kick to leave England under immense pressure on their own line. This break will go down down as a missed tackle for Cowan Dickey, but the defensive error was that of Atoje. One of England's best players was turned into a liability by simple gamesmanship. Itoje was favourite to be Lions captain going into the Six Nations, but if anyone thinks for a second Razi Erasmus won't be looking at this and taking notes, seeing a way to make the potential series captain ineffective and in the sim bin, it can only be because you assumed he would already have it written down. And as a uh, quick side note, Owen Farrell also kind of ruled himself out of the Lions captaincy on Saturday. Four years ago, Warren Gatlin selected Sam Warburton as captain because he said he was the best in the world at talking to referees. Whatever you think of, of the decisions themselves, Farrell showed on Saturday, he is not that. Give us a second, you've got to give us time to Please. Set. Last year, England seemed so hard to beat because despite having fewer weaponizable strengths than, say, New Zealand, France or the Springboks, they had no real obvious weaknesses. Yet, Wales kept finding them. George Ford was, predictably, pretty much responsible for England's attack improving on the last few months, which I'll get on to, but when kicking, him, Farrell and Young seemed to just fall into trap after trap. This is the most basic example of cat and mouse backfield cover, where a member of the back three deliberately presents an acre of open space that they tend to kick into, then when they do kick, they slide back and cover it easily, and Ford uncharacteristically just falls for it, just gifting the ball back to Wales. And from there, Wales would use it. The final act of Williams' try might be contentious, to say the least, but the build-up is really, really nice. Adams takes on the touchline and only backs clear out, no big body sacrifice, allowing Wales to set their ideal shape. Dan Bigger is stood on the 15 metre line, making these three England forwards necessary, you can't leave 10 metres in the middle of the field undefended, but also redundant, they're not marking anybody. Wales normally play a 1-3-2-2 shape, which means they line a bit like this. Their forwards divided into two groups of two, one group of three, and then one forward just on their own. But here, they slot Jonathan Davis in to be an extra forward, allowing them instead to operate on a 1-3-2-2-1, with Tipperick out of shot here on the wing. Alamund Jones, the one, is initially alone on Bigger's inside to hold these forwards, but once Johnny Hill shoots up to mark Navidi, Bigger fires it across his face to Owens, who smashes into contact. Instead of the other members of his designated free clearing out, Wales adapt, Alan Wynn entering and Davis sliding into the next group. Wales reload into exactly the same shape they played on the previous phase, only narrower. Bigger taking an equivalent position outside the group of free forwards, with Francis on his inside to hold them, just as Jones did. Curry covers Davis, and figuring it'll be the same line as last time, Ford shoots up to Mark Wynne Jones, running the same line Owens did moments earlier. Instead, Wales skip the entire three and hit up the two out on the wing. If we rewind quickly, Adam Beard actually points out this overlap and calls for the ball from the far side, but the phase in the middle allows Wales to suck in defenders so Beard can pass to his pod partner, Faletau, who has Tipperick outside him, meaning Johnny May has to stand off and let Faletau eat up yardage until Curry can track across and make the tackle. England straight offside, but with the advantage, Wales look to crash it up here through north, which creates a blind side consisting of the same defenders who were just getting back up to their feet from the previous phase. Except this time, Beard slots into Bigger's role, and May has to choose between Tipperick and Faletel, and Davis waits to pass until May's made up his mind, and then unleashes Faletel down the touchline. A nice loop play almost works, but it's shut down by England's great line speed, so Bigger takes it in rather than losing more ground, but the most important thing is Wales' attack reboots quickly, and the ball comes out fast. North distributes, and Adams drifts as he catches the ball, which changes him from being Slade's man to Farrell's man, meaning both have to watch him, and Anthony Watson comes in to mark both Williams and Reese Samet. So, with no sweeper in behind, Adams stabs the kick through for the only man fast enough to run the 100 meters in a vine, which is a social media platform he's probably too young to remember, but re it, you know, I think we all know what happens from here. 
This try is exactly why I don't like to talk about refereeing. Appreciating a beautiful bit of rugby, varying and evolving standard structure to create space and pace was lost behind bickering and occasional bullying. And this adaptation of Wales' game remained in the tight. After Ryland cracking their code in round one, Wales showed an ability to think on their feet at the line out. Here we can hear Atoje yell, BEARD! Beard at Sinclair, suggesting either he knows which Welsh lock the ball's going to, or they're discussing their favourite Ted Lasso characters. Wales casually reshuffle, and Alwyn Jones just jumps at the front instead. Or here, just as D is about to throw in, Dan Robson shouts, "It's this!" So Alwyn Jones aborts mission, jogs back, and throws his arms in the air to tell his hooker where to throw. Wales secure the ball, are able to do so on 14 of 15 lineouts, a significant improvement from the 11 from 15 in round one. And Wales seemed to have an answer for almost every question England posed, with their first try through Anthony Watson being a rare exception that proved the rule. England opt for a line-out from a dumb, unforced penalty by Wynne Jones, and hold the maul to commit all eight Welsh forwards before, in the absence of Tuolangi, throwing it to Farrell on the crash ball. Bigger does excellently, deliberately holding Farrell up in the tackle until the Welsh forwards are out of the maul and into the line. He concedes it, you know, an inch or two, but it allows the Welsh defence time to reset around him. However, the pack are only out and about, they're not spaced or spread properly. Properly, and it forces Davis to fill in for a forward defensively. Noticing this disconnect, Ford calls it, but he has no one around him running a line to exploit the hole, so he just takes it in. This leaves the Welsh defence scrambling, and England continue bringing forwards round from the open side late, each knowing their timing, but doing it with pace and a partner, meaning the Welsh defence needs to watch several options coming at them right before they have to make the tackle. England are playing at such a rate, Wales can't commit anyone to slow the ball and allow them to reset, the defence becoming more and more unorganised with each carry. And then Ford works out exactly how to unpick the defence and rushes round, but Young's picking up holds Alan Wynn long enough that he isn't needed at all. George can fix Adams, and from there it's just a hell of a finish by Anthony Watson to get it down. Seriously, this is a superb fit. This is a really, really good finish and a really, really well worked try. England superbly exhausting Welsh numbers to create space on the wing in just 46 seconds. So what the hell do I mean that Wales had an answer to it? See what I mean? He's a bias. Well, Wales simply didn't give them an opportunity to do this. Since really finding their attacking mojo in 2018, England have used their line-out as the primary launch pad for assaults on the opposition. In last year's Six Nations, all but three of England's 14 tries originated at the line-out, with the others being two against Italy and one from a scrum five. The line-out is where England thrive. If tries are bullets piercing through the opposition, the line-out is the gun they load them all into. Whereas other teams may have looked in past to jam the trigger or put on a bulletproof vest, Wales instead repealed the Second Amendment. Wales did not kick for touch once in the entire game. If ever they were under pressure, or on their own line, they simply hoofed it long. Here, Hardy kicks to Billy Vanapola. Wales have no idea what England will do off a line-out, but they know exactly what Vanapola's going to do if he gets over ahead of steam, and they put both props in his way to stop him as early as possible. England had just five line-outs in the game. Four from penalties, and the other from this unfortunate bounce on the good box by Kieran Hardy, everyone missing a kick designed to stay in play. One of those line-outs led to the try by Watson. One was stolen by Adam Beard, and England's first saw them try this. Last year, they exploited the fact Wales defend with Ken Owens, one of their slowest players, on the tail of the line-out to create this superb try for Anthony Watson. Here, they send their quickest forward, Tom Curry, round the corner expecting to make some ground on Owens to really create momentum that they can launch a move off. However, Wales have put Josh Navidi in to defend from the scrum half position, meaning he can wrap round to join Owens for the Saturday night in Cardiff tradition of smashing a curry, only this one results in a knock-on rather than a week of toilet trouble. The other two English line-outs show just how wise Wales were to cut them off at source, because England do begin to break them down. This attack is incredibly promising, and you can see George Ford getting into his groove. He picks a perfect pass to disable the Welsh defence, but unfortunately he forgets that Elliot Daly has some experimental surgery to replace his fingers with dicks before the match, and the chance dies. The other is even better, though. Ford drift, popping the ball to Vinopola whilst wrapping around. The ball is fast, and Earl hits a great line, at which point Ford flashes back and points and shouts for Young to keep going blind. He hits Mayland, who frees May down the wing. England's ball is quick and their shape set quicker, runners preventing anyone getting near forward until he's timed it to Genge, hitting a great line. But Elliot D adjusts his footing and scrags him superbly. Robinson picks, Ford points to this side, but the nine ignores him and looks for this part, comprising of Vanapola, Cowan Dickey, and she... Oh, shit. It's a lovely bit of innovation, England sliding Malins into this pod, but he hasn't used this role and overruns it, meaning the two forwards are no longer options, making it a really easy read for the Sheed. 
He looks up and sees Johnny May only has a five metre head start on Lewis Reese Zamet, so kicks for the world's fastest stick of celery to chase. Zamet has to actually slow down to try and control the ball. It bubbles and ultimately leads to Owen Farrell knocking it on on the try line. It's an 80 metre gain for Wales. This was part of a barnstorming and near perfect final 15 by Wales, and it comes right after England get themselves back level through this try from Ben Youngs. Wales, as per, kick long, and as Elliot Daly's eyeing up his return, a loud shout comes, which can be picked up on the ref mic. Daly, who has options. The voice you hear is that of Kyle Sinclair shouting, Sheedy! Find Sheedy! And so Daly kicks down the throat of Callum Sheedy, the only man in the Welsh backfield not known for their presence under the high ball. As such, May beats them to it and wins the ball back for England. For those unfamiliar, Sinclair and Sheedy are teammates at Bristol where they both play their club rugby. And so, Sinclair trains with him every day. He'll know inside out what the Welsh fly half is like under a high ball. In a campaign of jamminess by Wales, there is something satisfying in seeing a full pot of preserve thrown back in their face. From there, it's another George Ford special. He drifts round late, meaning North can't cover Watson and Slade until he's passed. Buying them time, Watson cuts back in really, really far in field, and it allows for quick ball. Ford calls it out the back and just holds the ball for an extra half second to draw Sheedy meaning Halaholo is alone in 15 metres. He makes the wrong read, and England can put May, once again, down the wing for a decent bust. Atoje carries to keep the pace high, and Wynne Jones drifts slightly off the ruck, meaning when he turns his head to consider the dummy, his body is no longer in Ben Young's way, and the nine can snipe through to score before realising he took the ball over the wrong white line and thumping the ground in frustration. This game was England's to win, but from that moment on, it never even looked on the cards. It begins with the Jammy Sheedy break, already discussed, but England are happy to grant Wales a line-out, and then Atoje is happy to grant Wales a penalty. Shortly after two great box kicks by Wales, pile pressure on. This forces May to run a fair distance diagonally to cover it, then Corey who was able to turn it over, Wales tried to play, realised it going nowhere, so kick it again, and put pressure on. England prevent D, who was superb off the bench, winning the turnover, and it's a second penalty. Then a third from another good kick, as Dan Robson pulls a play dumb enough to guarantee Ben Young's at least 206 more caps by blocking Reese Zamet's chase. Callum Sheedy is perfectly happy to step up and slot all three. And then, once they get into the English half, Wales run a very England play. Scrum keeps the flankers honest, flat ball to Halla Hollow, who's hugely powerful, and it takes what England have to stop him. No resources left to slow the ball, or focus on spreading out across the line, but they can't do that quickly enough. Watch how Corey Hill sprints round from the scrum into position, and lines himself up directly opposite Slade. He drives right into his midriff, putting him in an ideal position for an extra few inches of leg drive. Slade will stop him, but he can't drop him. Hill crosses to give Wales the bonus point, and an all-time points record total against England. Because, look, you can debate the two tries and take the quote from the refereeing board out of context all you like, but Wales were the better team on Saturday. This was a 16-point margin game. And even if you chalked off the first two tries, Wales had penalties between the posts they'd kick instead on both of them, putting them eight up at the final whistle, who knows. However, if I were an England fan, I'd be really confused, but not especially worried by this performance. As I pointed out pre-tournament, England had a weaker championship at this point in the previous World Cup cycle as Eddie Jones decided to stop innovating the attack so he could perfect it closer to the World Cup. And yet, there were clear signs when given opportunity, England could open up any team. If this side had four or five more lineouts, you can almost guarantee they would have scored at least one more try. But it was also so easy for Wales to take their main weapon away from them. The discipline remains the main concern, but everything else is just in a really weird space, and as for Wales, this is a team learning to lean into their jamminess, and looking to drop a big dollop of it on a pizza as they travel to Rome for a game that I really don't think can be taken for granted. If you were Franco Smith, heading to this campaign, Wales at home is the game you target, and even though this Welsh side is getting better game on game, they're suddenly entering a match as favourites for the first time in this tournament, and there are clear holes in their game there to be found, exploited and potentially prodded by Paolo and his posse. But for now, all Wales can do is spend the break week preparing to follow their finest leader since Glendor into battle two last times for matches that will surely decide for certain which of the two theories tells us just why Wales play in red. Thank you for watching and thank you again especially to Rodri from the BBC for those additional angles on the Josh Adams try. Uh, there's two more coming up as well if you want to see how Eddie Jones and Owen Farrell reacted live, you know, close-ups on them as the try is scored. Um, they're, they're fun, especially if you're a Welsh fan. Um, 
So yeah, so thank you to everyone that's watched that. Thank you to everyone that's watched that on Patreon. Hugely, hugely appreciated. And there'll be more coming up very shortly. I will move you on to Ireland against Italy next. There are videos on every game for the Six Nations. Please keep an eye out, and I'll see you very shortly. Can you just tell us when, you, when your time is back on? It's the ball that's been played. It is. They're playing one. Oh, Wales to get quickly. Josh Adams is going to score for Wales. Simon back on. has a little think about it. I think back on, Simon. No. Don't know if he signaled for goal, but if he didn't, he was not paying attention. Please, please. Please, 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 please. Well, just listen to this. It's the ball that's been played. It is. They're playing one. Oh, Wales to get quickly. Josh Adams is going to score for Wales. Tell me back home. has a little think about it. I think well, back home, Simon. No. Don't know if he signaled for goal, but if he didn't, he was not paying attention. Please, please. To get the ball into touch, Gareth Davis. And 